Ms. Heath Salen, I had the privilege to interview Mary and Stigman Hudson. Mary, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about it. Well, I'm a native of Georgia, and I went to the University of Georgia, and my senior year was 1941, the year of Pearl Harbor. And uh, I think Roosevelt knew we were going to get in the war because he was trying to build up a, a big force of civilian pilots, and he introduced the civil, civilian pilot training program. And the University of Georgia had that to train pilots. And I was lucky enough to be one of the women selected at the only time they offered it to women, one woman for every 10 men. And five, of a, uh, five of us were selected to learn to fly on the CPT course five out of 20 who applied, I believe it was. And of course, we didn't know Pearl Harbor was gonna happen, but we got our private licenses at the end of that course and got five hours college credit to boot. And then December 7th, along came Pearl Harbor. And by 1943, Uncle Sam was really desperate for pilots, and so desperate that uh, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel and decided to use women for stateside duty. and, and release the men to go overseas. So um, I was one of the were, was selected by Jacqueline Cochran to take training, Air Force training. I think about 2,000 of us, just I'll use rough numbers, I don't know the exact numbers, but about 2,000 of us entered training for the WASPs. And it was a six month, six month program when I went through. And later it was increased to seven months. Where did you take your training? At Sweetwater, Texas, out where the rattlesnake rattles and the buzzard builds its nest. <laughs> it was kind of warm. <laughs> Got pretty warm in the summertime, triple digits most of the time. And what sort of uniforms did they uh... Had no uniform at all except uh, what we call zoot suits when I first went to Sweetwater. Those were mechanics coveralls made for men and they came in two sizes, 42 and 44. <laughs> so we had to cinch the belt around us several times and roll up the pant legs. I didn't have to because I'm so tall, but it was way too big. But the girls that had to roll up the pant legs and the sleeves had a hard time looking military because <laughs> the crotch of the uniform was down around their knees. <laughs> we were not a very spiffy looking group. We, had, we were issued two of those and we got in the shower with a scrubbing brush and a bar of soap and washed down one suit while the other one was dry enough to put on. And we would swap them back and forth that way. That's what we lived in for six months. They Except really had no uniform for the ladies in those days. No uniform at all. Well, that changed somewhat. We went time. down to the dry goods store in Sweetwater and bought tan slacks and white shirts and tan overseas caps for our Sunday uniform. And that was as military as we could look. And of course, shoes were rationed. You only got two pairs of shoes a year, and you had to tear out a coupon out of your ration book to get that. And so our shoes were of any size, color, or shape that we could get for one of our coupons. And they didn't last very long when we marched in them. So we had to get them half sold and make do with two pairs a year, which is not easy when you're drilling. And you received your wings at Sweetwater after approximately six months? Mm -hmm. Six months in my and case. you were signed in where? Well, I was sent to the ferry command, the fifth ferrying group at Love Field in Dallas, Air Transport Command. Yeah, and it was heaven after Sweetwater. What, uh, what duties did you have? In the ferry command, we would go to the factories and pick up new airplanes, usually and ferry them to bases all around the country. And lots of them were ferried to Fort Dix, New Jersey, or other points of embarkation where the planes were taken apart and put on ships and sent overseas and then put back together when they got overseas. But um, sometimes we ferried old airplanes from base to base, just wherever we were needed. But of course, the WASP did a lot more than just ferry planes. That just happened to be my job. Your, your organization referred to as WASP, and WASP means what? Women Air Force Service Pilots. And of the 2,000 odd that were applied, uh, how many completed the training? Well, more than that applied. Actually, 25,000 people applied. But that's a sort of a misstatement because 
you had to be had to have a private license private pilot's license by the time I came along it had to be a lot more than that in the beginning you had to have hundreds of hours to qualify for training but by the time March 1943 came along they reduced it down to a private pilot's license and there were not 25,000 licensed pilots women pilots there were only about 3,000 roughly 3,000 a few more than that women pilots so 25,000 people applied but that didn't mean they were qualified to apply but anyway, 2,000 were accepted for training, and of, of that number, a little more than 1,000 of us made it through, got our wings. It was a highly selective process. Yeah, it was. You know, those uh, who finally made the cut, the washout rate was about 50%. Pretty, not quite that high. More than a third washed more out. Than a uh -huh. third. Well, of course, in World War II, that was the uh, Air Corps' way of uh, winnowing Mm -hmm. I recall how disappointed uh, some of my classmates were in navigation school when they washed up very close uh, to the end of the program. Yeah, really. it was heartbreaking. You yeah. felt like your whole life was ruined. Right. And you went back, you went back to the Army, maybe to be an <laughs> infantry soldier or whatever. So you're in love feeling, Dallas? Mm -hmm. I, I actually spent a lot of time in Wichita, Kansas, on what they call detached orders, which means I would report back there after I delivered a plane instead of reporting back to Love Field. Because there were three aircraft factories in Wichita, Kansas. There was the Beechcraft factory, the Boeing factory, and the Cessna factory. And you would, you would pick up uh, aircraft off the assembly line and take them to the mm -hmm. various fields right. throughout the country. The first 20 minutes or so of your flight was considered a check, I mean a test flight. Actually, they had been test flown before by the factory, but when we would pick them up, we would fly them uh, the first 20 or 30 minutes of our route was considered a test flight, and if something didn't seem right or didn't sound right, we would turn around and take it back. But I never had to do that, except in one case when a AT-6 caught on fire with me, but I was still on the ground at the North American factory in Dallas. And uh, I, I couldn't put it out. We were told to jam the throttle forward, and it would blow the flames out. But when I jammed the throttle forward, the flames just got higher. And by the time they were coming over the cockpit, I was out of there. But two mechanics with, with uh, fire extinguishers were standing nearby, and one of them hopped in the uh, cockpit. And, and between the two of them, they, with the fire extinguisher, they, they got the fire out. But I always felt like a coward getting out of the cockpit, but I thought that thing was about to blow. Still <laughs> I wasn't <alive>. about to. <laughs> and they are too, thank goodness. <laughs> thank goodness they're still alive too, or were when I saw them. Well, uh, we're now through most of 43, and uh, 1944 came along. I know that you had an interest in a Marine pilot who was in the hospital. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Well, he was a boy from my hometown, Athens, Georgia. <clears throat> Our families knew each other, and we knew each other, but he was eight years older, so there had never been any romance or anything. But um, I admired him and always had. He was a wonderful person. So when he crashed and burned and was not expected to live, I wrote to him every day to keep his spirits up. And uh, we wrote back and forth. He was in the hospital a year and a half. And we wrote back and forth. And I, my letters took him all the way through my training and my ferry command experience. And we sort of fell in love through our letters. And of course, meanwhile, I had managed to make a few illegal landings in Norfolk, Virginia, because he was in the hospital, I mean, in Richmond, Virginia, at the Army airfield there which was closed to ferry traffic, but I would uh, take a chance and land there anyway and get on a ferry boat and go over to Norfolk where he was in the Navy hospital. And uh, we had our dates that way illegally. So we just really had a very few dates before we decided to get married. Well, when you you moved fast in World War II. <laughs> you moved fast in World War II because you, you didn't know if you were going to be alive the next month or not. That's right. Yeah. Major Tom Right. Later yeah. promoted. He was later promoted to a lieutenant colonel. But he was uh, 
perfecting a night landing technique that he was going to take over into the Pacific. He was with the first night first Marine night fighter group that went over to the Pacific, but he didn't make it because he crashed just before they were due to leave. But he was trying to perfect the night landing uh, technique, and uh, as he was coming in to land with no lights and simulating a night, the conditions that he would find in the South Pacific, um, a bomber took off right in his path, and the tower either didn't see it or didn't warn him or something. Anyway, they collided. Fortunately, nobody in the bomber was hurt, but he was critically injured and burned, horribly burned. But he had such a wonderful spirit about it all and, and stayed so upbeat with the whole thing that that was one thing that made me fall in love with him. And he, had, he had his wharf flying into Richmond. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, not very often, though. I think I only got there twice. <laughs> That must have been a real morale boost. <laughs> and uh, your your friends in the, in the WASP went on to some other airplanes. Uh, yeah, the WASP flew every fighter and every bomber in the Air Corps arsenal. Of course, it was the Army Air Corps, Army Air Forces in those days. But we, they, the WASP, not I, flew everything in the arsenal, all the bombers and all the fighters, including the B-29. One of my roommates, not roommates, classmates, bought a P-38 at the end of the war. Did she fly it? She flew it, but she couldn't afford to keep it. It was such a gas guzzler, and hangar space was so expensive, and maintenance, and so on, and nobody had any money in those days. So she had to let it go, but think what that would be worth now. Woo. It would be worth a lot of money. Sure would. Uh, I recall I was in Mountain Home, Idaho, and we went out on a gunnery mission, which meant that uh, somebody was toward a target and our gunners would take pot shots at them with 50 caliber ammunition. Well, it happened that taking the air was a B-26, which was a red-hot airplane, as you recall, sometimes called a Widowmaker. And uh, after the mission was over, the B-26 came and landed, and this little bitty girl very attractive, I might add. Got out of the airplane, and all the four-engine bomber pilots, instead of whistling at us, <laughs> would be expected, they sat around, why do these girls get to fly those hot airplanes <laughs> and we fly these four-engine boxcars? <laughs> Tough luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that, uh, that uh, Colonel Paul Tibbetts checked some of your uh, Two of space for help. Uh, yeah, uh, Paul Tibbetts trained two WASPs to fly the B-29. In two days, he checked them out in the B-29, and they went around the country to demonstrate how easy it was to fly because it had a horrible reputation of catching on fire on the takeoff, and the chief test pilot at Boeing had been killed in it, and the men were balking at flying it. So Paul Tibbetts, actually, Hap Arnold, General Arnold, was the one that had the idea, but he got Paul Tibbetts to execute it. Um, to have the women demonstrate how easy it was to fly, and sure enough, that shamed the, the men back into the cockpit. They never had another man refuse to fly it. Good, good for them. When you reflect back on those days, uh, do you have an outstanding experience that comes to mind? Well, not when I was flying it, but when I was on an airliner taking off over New York City. The airliners were mostly DC-3s in those days, as you know. And we were taking off from LaGuardia Field in New York City and lost both engines on the takeoff in the DC-3. That's, that's the thing I remember most, that and the AT-6 that caught on fire with me. I guess you remember the excitement and not the long, boring hours. But anyway, somehow the angels held us up and we got back in the field. He broke every rule in the book. You're never supposed to turn towards the dead engine and one engine went out first, and he turned toward that engine. The plane was full of nothing but ferry pilots, one other wasp and myself, and uh, all the rest were men ferry pilots. And everybody screamed when the pilot turned toward the dead engine, but he got away with it. And they say, never turn back to the airport, and he turned back to the airport. And he got away with it and got us down. Just barely cleared the high-tension wires, wheels up, of course, and then as we got to, almost to the ground, he let the wheels down, and we didn't roll that far. 
he was 20, 26 years old, I think, 24 or 26, the captain. On, on occasion, uh, some of our people go into the high schools and colleges talk about their war experiences. And one of the impressions that we get from the children is they didn't realize how young we were in those days. <laughs> I tell them I wasn't always an old lady. <laughs> Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight wasps were killed. killed in air crashes of one sort mm -hmm. or another. Right. Would you like to uh, talk about some of these? Well, the sad part was that there was no provision to send the bodies home, and we had to take up a collection to send the bodies home to the families, and uh, sit up all night in the box car with the coffin, and it was awful cold in the winter. I didn't ever have to do it, but. I was told how cold it was in the winter and how hot it was in the summer to have that duty. And then when the girls got home with the uh, body of the deceased, um, there was no, they were not allowed to put a flag on the coffin and were not allowed to put a gold star in the window because we were still civil service employees and not really part of the Air Force at that point. Now, 30 years later, by an act of Congress, we were made retroactively members of the Army Air Forces, or the U.S. Air Forces, the way my honorable discharge reads. And uh, so they corrected that 30 years later, but it didn't do us any good at the time. We didn't have any money to bury the, the dead, or not to bury the dead, but to get the body home. You, you were not accorded normal benefits? No, no, we didn't have any insurance. And, of course, we made less than the man, but this was in the 40s, and we didn't really expect to be treated equally. We just felt lucky to be there at all and to be given that chance to fly those big, beautiful airplanes. Isn't it amazing how the country came together after Pearl Harbor? Just amazing, and I've never seen it like that since. Oh, yeah. We were all pulling together, and everybody was patriotic. And, gosh, if, if anybody hadn't been patriotic, I think he would have been lynched real quick. That's right. But... Um, it was amazing how the whole country pulled in the same direction and cooperated. Of course, we had been attacked, and we knew what we were fighting for, so it was different. But I would love to see that same spirit of cooperation now. I don't think we'll ever see it again, the way things are going. We knew who the bad guys were. Yeah. It's it was clear cut. contemplate what sort of world we'd have today. Mm. Hitler trial oh. and the Japanese. Yeah. World War II was a unusual period in the history of this country. We were privileged to. Uh, it really, it. really was a privilege. And in fact, I. I'm so, still so patriotic that I cry every time the flag goes by. And when I pledge allegiance, I get a lump in my throat. And now the Supreme Court is considering whether or not to take under God out of it. <laughs> Boy, howdy. <laughs> it's a strange new world. On the other hand, uh, women have been accorded opportunities that you never dreamed of True. back in the 40s. For instance, there's an astronaut, a mm -hmm. lady astronaut, whose father was a gunner in my bomb group. Is that right? And uh, huh. it's not unusual for women pilots to be flying any type of airplane with military rank. One of the problems mm -hmm. is uh, when, when you sit in the left seat, you're the boss. <laughs> that do create a problem. So uh, the men on the crew have to pay attention to this. <laughs> uh, like their mother speaking to them. They don't like it. Did, uh, did you get back home at all during this period? I made some illegal landings in Athens. And <laughs> I remember one time my mother came rushing. I had called ahead and told her I was on my way from Atlanta. And so I could see her car coming out to Epps Field in Athens. And uh, by the time I landed, she was already there. And before I could get the engine shut down, she started running straight toward the propeller. Scared me to death. I thought I was going to decapitate my own mother. But I got it shut down before she did it. But it was nip and tuck there for a while. 
but yes, I, I landed. It was I wasn't supposed to land at Richmond, and I did, and I didn't get caught, thank goodness. And uh, wasn't supposed to land at Athens, and I did, and didn't get caught. Statute of limitations. Yeah, of right. I can say it now. Uh, I've had the privilege of reading the book you put together in regard to your World War II experiences, and also. Ta-da. Yes. It's uh, titled is "Winning by Wings." There it is. There it is. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about it. Well, it took me 50 years to write it, for one thing. I started writing it when I first got out of the Wasps, while everything was fresh in my mind. Thank goodness, because I could never have written the flying scenes. I wouldn't have been able to remember all the details of the cockpit checks and things like that. Um, anyway, nobody was interested in World War II things after World War II, right after World War II. Everybody wanted to return to normal just as fast as possible and get back to normal living. So I tried writing short stories about this. I had some good luck selling short stories in those days. There was a good short story market, but not for World War II stories, so they didn't want that. Then I tried writing it as a fictional book and had no luck with that. And they just weren't, the market wasn't right. But now all of a sudden the market is right and the market is hot. So I've had really good success with this. It went through two printings with the Naval Institute Press as the publisher, and now I'm selling it myself. And it's had some all, some uh, inquiries from Hollywood, which I'm excited about. I hope they make it into a movie. I hope they do too, before I die. It's got all, it's got all the... <laughs> ingredients? <laughs> ingredients, thank you. <laughs> I just thought of the lady's name and introduced the bill uh, that gave veterans benefits to the war, but they were Boggs. Boggs. Lin Lindy Boggs. Lindy. She's called Lindy. Uh-huh. And uh, her daughter is uh, Cokie Roberts. Right. Uh, Cokie Roberts quotes a lot of my books in, in, in her book. I mean a lot of my uh, letters in her book. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Oh, interesting. Uh, in fact, her, Cokie's book came out before mine did. So I had to tell my publisher that I had given her permission to use those letters, but didn't create any problem. It was just a little bit of overlap. I, I've not read Cokie Roberts' book. It's good. I'll have to do that. I'll lend you my copy. Well, as the story goes along, uh, unhappily, pilots started to come back from overseas and they started to close flying schools, which meant that pilot flying instructors who were civilians were subject to the draft. And what did they do? Well, they didn't like that, and they didn't want to get in the marching army. So they resented the fact that women had taken up the cockpits, and they didn't have anywhere to go except to be drafted. So they started lobbying Congress to get us out of there, and they did. Yeah, General Arnold, I understand, fought it uh, yeah. when he lost that particular battle, which Kind of Won the war, but lost the battle. That's right. So uh, you were you left the uh, war when? In June of 1944. Yeah, then what happened? Well, I got married. Married to a Marine. <laughs> right. Who was in station where? In Texas. He was the executive officer at the Marine Corps Air Station outside of Fort Worth. We were stationed there for a year, and then went out to Miramar, California until VJ Day. But the WASP stayed on duty until December of 44. But since they didn't need us anymore and, and they were raising such cane about us, I resigned in June of 44 so I could marry my, my the love of my life. And then he got out of the Marine Corps? He was retired physically. Um, but the, he served until, in, act, he actually got back on flight status, but not to go overseas. I think they call it class two pilot or something like that. But he got uh, back where he could fly again. He recovered really well and stayed on duty until VJ day and then they retired him. So they knew he'd never be able to do combat with his burned legs. He got a stiff ankle out of the deal so he couldn't go back to flying for the airlines, which is what he had done before he went into the Marine Corps. Well, actually, he went in the Marine Corps, and then he got out and went flying for Eastern Airlines, and then 
Pearl Harbor came along and he was called back into the Marine Corps. He was in the reserves. Well, he was he was a pilot early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the early early pilots. So now we're at BJ Day. You're happily married. Your husband is out of the Marine Corps. Then what? Then he went back to work for Eastern Airlines, but they told him he could never fly as captain and that if he would be satisfied to remain a co-pilot, they'd take him back as a pilot, but to understand that with his stiff ankle, he didn't, they didn't think he could handle the plane in an, in an emergency. And uh, so they gave him a job on the ground as an aircraft dispatcher, and he could hardly stand that with all his friends up in the sky. And yeah, it was hard, and it was also uh, shift work, which was all, made it hard. But I could keep his schedule. I mean, I might eat breakfast at midnight, but whatever his schedule was, I kept the same thing until I got pregnant. And then I couldn't keep his schedule anymore. I had to keep the baby's schedule. So that was when he decided that it was time to change. And we got an opportunity to move to Texas and start an insurance company, a life insurance company. And he took it. And so we lived there for more than 50 years until he died. Well, it became profitable company, mm -hmm. It was just a small company, but it did quite well. I believe you told me your first child was born in Piedmont Hospital. Were you living right. in Atlanta? We were living in Hapeville, Hapeville. out near the airport, because he was working at Eastern Airlines, and he would go back and forth on his bicycle from Hapeville. He needed to ex keep exercising those legs that had been so badly burned. He was sort of like Vance, what's his name? Did you do any flying, serious flying after you left the wash? Haven't flown for 60 years. Think you're ready to get back in the cockpit? <laughs> well, if this becomes a movie and I get enough money, I'm buying me an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> it's good for you. How about, I'll go to ride with you. Okay, if you're brave enough. I had an experience on Maxwell Field, Alabama, several years ago. I went over to the graduation of the Air Command of Staff College. and. Uh, I was with uh, George Gay, for instance, the great naval hero and some others. We all had on our little medal that you wear. <laughs> and this cute little major came over, a pilot, and she said, what are all these for? So I think I told her a combat story, too. And uh, she said, well, can I hug you? I said, of course. And I said, what are you going to do when you get out of this command of staff college? I said, I'm going to Travis Air Force Base. The aircraft commander on a C-141. Wow. I was born about 30 years too soon. I could have been a navigator. Uh, a whole couldn't. different world out there now. So. It sure is. Well, you've written a book, and you've had uh, two sons. Two sons and a daughter. Now you have five S grandchildren. Six grandchildren and a great-grandchild to be born next month. Marion came all the way from Wichita Falls, Texas, to talk today to our Civil Wings group. And just charmed them considerably and <laughs> sold a few books. And some of the questions were right interesting, weren't they? They were. And I've forgotten what, uh, what they asked. Do you remember any of the questions? Did any of them particularly uh, cite you? Or I, I was surprised that nobody asked me what type planes I flew or um, what was the other thing they always asked me, how many hours I had. Mm -hmm. And, well, and nobody what? nobody uh, there asked me either question, and I was surprised because that's usually the first two questions that pilots ask me, and I'm always embarrassed to answer because I didn't fly the big, the big bombers or the fast fighters. I just ferried single and twin engine airplanes. But they were big enough and fast enough for me. <laughs> I'm not sure my reflexes would have been fast enough to handle a P-51. Oh, you would have been surprised, I think. <laughs> How many hours did you get there? About 500. About 500? Mm -hmm. You know, that's uh, the number I had when I left the Air Corps. Really? Uh, of which 265, as I recall correctly, were combat hours. So I had more wow. more combat than well. I did. Your hours were a little bit harder to come by than mine were. <laughs> Some of them were known when 
not fun at games, I admit to that. Well, there's a long pause. Marion, tomorrow we'll be telling our story to the World War II Roundtable. as a matter of interest, Marion's father was a well-known figure in the University of Georgia. Why don't you tell us a little bit about him? He had such well, an amazing career. Well, he was such a wonderful man. Um, he was such a wonderful father and such a wonderful family man, wonderful husband, that I, I don't even think about his career until somebody like you asked me. But he had coached everything, football, basketball, baseball, and track at the University of Georgia, and really put the school on the map as far as athletics were concerned. He, when he died, he was director of athletics and dean of men. He gave up uh, the sports he coached one at a time. All I can remember him coaching in my childhood was the basketball team and, and the track team. Well, you went to some football games. Yeah, I was at the Georgia-Yale game, 15 to nothing, when they dedicated the stadium. First game in Sanford Stadium. First game in Sanford Stadium, and Yale was expecting to clobber Georgia, and instead they got clobbered. Yeah, it, was like, it was like playing Miami University. <laughs> That's a great team. Uh, I had a good Catfish fortune to some of those games. Yeah. Not the I had a big crush on Catfish Smith. He didn't know it. I was about 12 years old, I guess. Athens, Athens is a wonderful place to grow up and a wonderful place to go to school. I agree. And I'm sure that uh, many people will share your uh, opinion. You told me that when you went to Texas and they spoke at the university, you didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> I Texas didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> yeah, the university to me meant the University of Georgia, and that was a great shock when I heard Texans talking about the university and they meant Texas. You were down at Austin. <laughs> right. Well, what is it, 60 years ago? Let's see. Got out in 44. How many years is that? It'll be 60 years next year. 60 years next year. Uh -huh. Good and long time. as soon as you get the movie rights sold to your book, <laughs> you're going to be back in your own airplane. <laughs> well, I don't, think, I don't think the movie rights per se will get me there, but maybe the movie will. Yeah. And you can take your grandchildren and your grandchildren. Right. right. Mary, I thank you very much for well, you are very to welcome. Into the History Center and share your experience with World War II. And we hope you'll come back often. Thank you.